Bible this morning, if you would please, for our scripture reading, do Psalm 1, the very first Psalm, Psalm 1. Just six verses in this Psalm, and let's just read it all together in unison this morning, all six verses, all right? As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word together, and let's begin on verse 1 of Psalm chapter 1. Ready? Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Lord, I pray that you would continue to make our hearts ready to receive the truth that you have for us today. Thank you, Lord, for the good music this morning that we've had. And Lord, I pray that you'll continue now to use the special to minister to our heart. And I pray, Lord, that each of us will be open to what you want to say to each of us today. Holy Spirit, have your way in our midst, please. And bless the special as it's sung this morning. Tune our heart with your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
temptation for yielding is sin each victory will help you some others to win fight manfully onward dark passions subdue look ever to Jesus he will carry you through ask the Savior to help you come for strength and keep you he is willing to aid you he will carry you through Jesus, he will carry you through. Ask the Savior to help you. Come for strength and keep you. He is willing to aid you. He will carry you through. To shall conquer though often cast out he who is our savior our strength will renew look ever to Jesus he will carry you through ask the savior to help Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. And Lord, I pray that you will speak to our hearts this morning. We thank you for the Bible. <clears throat> thank you, Lord, for preserving your word for us, that we can have copies of it in our hand this morning. And Lord, I pray that the word of God will be quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Lord, that each of us will listen carefully and that you will accomplish what you desire in each one of our hearts. Help me as I bring the truth this morning and help each individual as they listen. Keep us from distraction. Give us all ears to hear what you want to say to each of us today. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> help me a little bit with this, Dean, if you would. And um, fight a little bit of allergies this time of year. Psalm 1, God's formula for happiness. It starts out with blessed. Blessed is a word in the Bible that it just means happy. Most of you know Psalms is the songbook of Israel. And this is the very first song that sets the stage, sets the foundation for the rest of the book. What, what's interesting to me is uh, in a recent survey, the opinions came back that only 20% of Americans say they're happy. That's an amazing thing. Because... We have more to live with than any other country in the world. And yet, people are not happy. In fact, one psychiatrist offered this explanation. He said, quote, Happiness is an imaginary condition formerly attributed by the living to the dead, now usually attributed to adults by children and by children to adults. In other words, the adults look at the kids and think, boy, those were the days. That's when I was happy. And the kids look at the adults and say, boy, I can't wait till I'm that age and I'll be happy. 
But nobody is, it's imaginary. Nobody can obtain it. But God gives us a formula here in Psalm 1 about a truly happy man. And it's, it's not a mystery. It's not something that you're always, the carrot's out in front of you and you've got to keep chasing it. Sometimes people put happiness at, at, at some, listen, any object on earth is never going to bring you lasting happiness. Because everything here is temporal. Everything here will go away. So mom, I, if I, so many times people just think, well, if I just get a, a bigger house, if I just had a better job, if I just had a different car, if I just had a different spouse, if I just had different children, if I just lived in a different area, if I just, and on and on and on it goes, then I'd be happy. Then I'd be all right. Then I'd be satisfied. That's what I'm looking for. And they get there only to find out it's evaded them once again. You see, Psalm 1, if you look at it with me, Notice with me verse number 3, the last phrase of verse number 3. What does it say, church? And whatsoever shall what? Prosper. How many would like to say, you know what, Pastor, if you could tell me something that whatever I do would prosper, I'm interested. Anybody like that? Well, sure. Oh, he says, hey, and whatsoever he do will flop. I know, you say, I already got that one down, Pastor. I don't need any help with that, okay? No, nobody says, ah, oh, what can I do to be a failure? Nobody's interested in that. But tell me that whatsoever I do will prosper, I'm interested. How does that work? Well, God gives us a formula here to help us to get to the end of verse number 3. Now, to get to verse number 3, you have to go through verses 1 and 2, okay? Brilliant, isn't it? And uh, so we're going to look real, just briefly at 1 and 2 and we're going to get to the crux of the message this morning. Notice, first of all, God says if you're going to get to where whatsoever you do will prosper, you're going to have to separate yourself from the world. You're going to have to live a life that is separate from the world. Notice in verse 1, Blessed is the man, what does blessed mean? Happy is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So we're told not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Walk is, is a, another way to say how we live. It's, it's when you walk, you take repeated steps in one direction. Okay? So God says don't, don't walk, don't take repeated steps in the counsel or the advice of the ungodly. Don't, don't do that. Paul said in the book of Ephesians, you were formerly darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Take repeated steps in the light, not in darkness. Those who don't know God are pictured in the Bible as being in darkness. And you can't see anything. You know, most of the time, you don't want to walk in the dark. Bad things happen. When you get up in the middle of the night, for the reasons you get up in the middle of the night, <laughs> you like to have a little light or your toes will find something to run into. And so you want light. Walk in the light. Don't walk in the darkness. Don't live by the advice of the ungodly. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, you're struggling in your marriage. Somebody says, well, my," you start talking to people at work. You say, my husband doesn't listen to me. He works all the time. He's selfish. He just cares about himself. The passion has left our marriage. I don't think he thinks about me anymore. He just cares about this and that and this. Oh, well, what are you staying with him for? Man, get rid of that guy. They advise you get a divorce. They advise you leave him behind. Do you walk in the counsel of the ungodly? Do you listen to people who don't love the Lord and follow their advice? God says you can't do that if you're going to be happy. You cannot do that. It all starts with not walking in the counsel of the godly. Either you, you, you have to come to the point where you decide, will I live like the world wants me to live? Or will I live like the Word tells me to live? Which, which one am I going to follow? 
Which way am I going to take my repeated steps? Will I go the way of the world or will I go the way of the Word? But secondly, he says, that's not, it doesn't stop there. He says, don't nor stand in the way of sinners. In other words, if you continue to walk in the counsel of ungodly, here's the next thing you're going to do. You're not walking anymore. What are you doing? You're standing. And you're hanging out with sinners. The word sin is, is, is to... Sin is a transgression of the law. In other words, those who disobey God and don't care. And now, those are the people you're hanging around. Those are the people that you're keeping company with. And you begin to follow their moral path. Oh, you may not get drunk, but you're around the people who are. Oh, you may not, you may not be immoral, but you're hanging around people who are. You understand you're standing and you're hanging with sinners. I don't want to position myself with people who openly break God's law. That's standing with sinners. Those who, uh, uh, who, who don't care what God wants to do with their life, then it progresses further than that. Then it says you don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Hey, I was walking and I'm listening to their advice and pretty soon I'm standing and I'm hanging out with them. Now what am I doing? I'm sitting down with them. And I'm scoffing. The scornful scoffs at the things of God. You don't have to believe that. You don't have to. What are you going to church again for? You're going back on Sunday night? What's wrong with you? You don't have to do that. You know? You, you, give, to, you, give, you give that and then you give to missions too? Man, what's wrong with you? You know, that, that, that church just wants your money. And they scoff at the things of God. And, and he's saying, don't, 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 don't sit with people that want to mock the Bible, mock Jesus, scoff at the things of God, scoff at moral absolutes. Don't sit down with them. You listen to their advice, you follow their advice, to finally you sit down and you become a part with them. Now listen, all God's saying is, if you want to be blessed, if you want to get down to where everything you do will prosper, there's where it starts. Now, he's going to talk in verse 2 about what you've got to put into your life, but before you can put it in, you've got to get the wrong stuff out. You can't put more in on top of all the bad. You've got to get the bad out so you can put the good in. So there's the negative before you get to the positive. Okay? Verse 2 is the positive. Not only do you separate from the wrong crowd, but you must be, number two, saturated with the Word. But His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. That means you delight in God's Word. You delight to be around the Bible. And so He says, and here's the thing. You say, well, I don't have a real delight for God's Word. Are you obeying verse 1? You know what happens? If you don't obey verse 1, you never fulfill verse 2. As long as the ungodly, as long as the sinner, as long as the scoffer is included in your life, you'll never delight in the law of the Lord. It'll take that away from you. But you delight in the law of the Lord by putting those wrong things out. And God says, once that's out, you don't have an empty life. No, I'm going to fill it up. And I'm going to fill it up with my word. And you're going to meditate there in day and night. Meditate is to saturate something. It's, it's kind of like a sponge. As you, as you put a sponge under the spigot and you run the water on it. And it fills up. And pretty soon when that sponge is full, you just squeeze that a little bit and boy, water comes out. And the idea here is, I want to saturate myself with the Word of God. I want to fill myself with the Word of God so that whenever somebody squeezes me, the Word of God will come out. What are you saturated with? When you get squeezed, when somebody puts pressure on you, what comes out? That's what you're full of. Okay? God says, well, you have to think about the Bible all the time? No, well, of course not. Just day and night. Uh, the rest of the time's yours. God said day and night. In Joshua 1.8, He said, Joshua, 
This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein. There it is again. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that's written therein. So, continuing to delight in the Word of God. And when you delight in something, you don't mind thinking about it day or night. You don't mind thinking about it at all. Those who, those who delight in Ohio State football thought nothing yesterday about getting down to the stadium about 8 o'clock in the morning or so and going through all the stuff in the morning time and then all the pregame things that uh, starting in the afternoon and walking over with the team and the band and all the hoopla and the homecoming and then after the game's over, staying in the parking lot and having a good time and probably not getting home till 9, 10 o'clock at night and spent 12 hours or 14 hours for Ohio State football. And you know what? They loved it. Why? That's what they delight in. See? What do, what do, what do, what do you delight in? What do I delight in? Saturated with the Word of God. You have to spend time with God's Word. There's no substitute for spending time in the Word of God. You'll never be a consistent Christian if you don't. You'll never make it. If you want to be happy, blessed by God, you have to be separate from the world. You have to be saturated with the Word. And then, the third thing he mentions here is you'll, you have to be situated by the water. Verse 3 says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The practice in Israel and many of the ancient lands of that day where you would water your gardens, your trees, everything by irrigation ditches to get the water to where they are. In other words, their trees planted by the irrigation ditches would prosper. Contrasted with the trees that would grow out away by themselves would soon wither and die, dry up and die. So you have to you have to situate yourself with and near the water. Now, there's many things Jesus said that he's the living water. And he's gonna he said, Whoever believes on me out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But the word of God is water. The washing of the water by the word. And 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 you get refreshment from the word of God. And so you understand. Uh, the 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 I want to be I want to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I'm going to talk to you this morning. That was your introduction. I want to talk to you this morning about be like a tree. Be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You know, hold your finger in Psalm one. And turn over to Jeremiah 17. Would you look there just for a moment? I want you to see this scripture. Another description of the man who will be like a tree. Jeremiah 17. Look with me at verse number 7. If you're there, you say amen. Ready? First word of verse 7. Blessed. What's blessed mean? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when heat cometh. But her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. That's a wonderful promise. So we're, we're, we're comparing a vibrant, fruitful Christian to being like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Now, what are the attributes of a tree that ought to be present in the life of a Christian? Well, number one, I believe you notice the tree is planted. He shall be like a tree planted. The tree 
grows to maturity in the place it's planted. The trees must be planted. The Bible talks about us being planted together in the likeness of Jesus' death. Raised in the likeness of His resurrection. Picturing our baptism after salvation. David said this in Psalm 92, They that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Planted. The sense in which God is, is planting us. The Word of God is known to be planted in our heart. God, God, God puts us places. God plants us. Have you ever allowed God to plant you? Are you listening? We live in... We live in such a transient America. People coming and going and up and moving and in and out. And, and somebody says, uh, have you worked here a long time? Oh yeah. How long have you been here? Three years. And they think they've been at work job a long time. We were talking about the fellow we met on the airplane on vacation this summer and worked for a local heating and air conditioning company. He said the hardest thing is keeping good workers. Finding good workers. And then having them stay. They get a couple of paychecks and they're done. They're gone. Uh, being able to stay planted. Being able to, to, to bloom where God plants you. You know, you, when, when God says he, he wants you to be planted or rooted in Him, in fact, that's, what, that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. A tree is not just planted, it's rooted. A tree grows roots. That's why you plant the tree and you're, if you ever had property and you needed to put trees down, you're strategic how you plant the trees. Because you know they're going to take roots. And, and you have to be cautious. Uh, we, we have a tree in our front yard. Some of you have been to our house. It's a, it's a big tree and we're going to have some issues with that because already the roots have grown and it's breaking up our sidewalk. Somebody, whoever, whoever built it, whenever they built it 20 some years ago, they weren't thinking about the roots eventually are going to come in get too close to the house. We're going to have some issues. You have to think about uh, the roots. The Christian is to be rooted or settled. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3, would you please? Ephesians chapter 3, the book of Ephesians. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And he addresses this with them. Ephesians chapter 3. Are you doing okay? A tree... Is planted, a tree is rooted. Notice Ephesians 3. Verse number 17, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being what church? Rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God, Rooted and grounded in love. Putting your roots down. Kind of putting the solid foundation and making sure that, that, that you have roots. Look at Colossians chapter 2. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians is right after Ephesians, and then Colossians is the very next book. Look at Colossians 2 with me, please. Verses 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, Colossians 2.6, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You're rooted, then you're built up in Him, and you're established in the faith. You know why some people never get built up? They never take time to get rooted. What happens if you take a tree and you plant the tree and about uh, a year later you uproot it and move it somewhere else and dig a hole and put it in? It may go. It may take off. But what I say, you leave it there for a year then you dig it back up and move it over here and put it down and put it in. Is that tree ever going to mature to where it needs to be? No. Why? You're uprooting it all the time. You're uprooting it all the time. It'll never bear fruit. It'll, it'll wither. It'll wither. The leaves won't come in like they should. It never will be what God wants to be. It never build up to what God wants to be because it's always being uprooted. Listen to me, Christian. You constantly uproot yourself. 
and want to go here and go there and go, and, and go all over and you uproot everything, you know what? You'll never be built up in Him. You'll never be built up to what God wants you to be. you never get established in the faith by doing that. You have to get settled. At some point, you just got to let your roots grow and say, guess what? This is my house. This is my cars. This is my wife. This is my children. This is my home. This is my church. This is my life. Here's where I'll grow. This is it. That's how you build something. You don't build anything. Uh, you don't build anything in a year or two. Hmm? Brother Wallace had a, a wonderful testimony at Sigma where he worked. Oh, it wasn't Sigma when he first went to work there. Hmm. Sugar foods. And then... It was something after that, wasn't it? Then, then Sigma bought out sugar foods. That's what I thought, bought out several times. They changed things, but Bob just stayed, stayed put. What was he doing? Putting down roots. But he wasn't just putting down roots. He was putting down roots so he could build up something. And he built up a testimony there. And he built up a testimony for Jesus Christ that wouldn't have happened if he didn't stay put. And put down roots. You see, you have to let the roots go down to be built up. A tree is settled in one spot after being planted so it can grow and so it can mature. And that's why we get settled and rooted in Christ so we can grow and mature. And when the roots are deep, that's what withstands the storm. It's not the branches, it's not the leaves, it's not even the trunk. What keeps the tree upright in the storm is the roots. How deep are the roots? Many Christians never put their roots down. That's why they get blown about with every wind of doctrine. Every new thing that comes along, they get, they get sucked into it. It's in Ephesians chapter 4, by the way. Rooted and built up in Him. Let Listen, Christian, let me help you. Let God plant you and then get rooted and grow where God plants you. And quit uprooting and going all the time. It's, it, you'll never grow to maturity. You'll never get there. Listen, we just finished the missions conference. Brother, Brother Fitzsimmons and... Um, Brother Mullins, 62 churches planted that, that they know of. There are Bible college graduates that could have went out and started churches that they're not even aware of. But at least 62 churches they know of. How does that happen? They stayed 30 years. They got there and put down roots. You know what happens when you stay somewhere 30 years? You built something. You built something. The average church in America, the average church across all denominations, runs 75 people. But the average pastor stays at his church two and a half years before he moves on. Well, how come the average church is 75? That's about all the, all the more growth you can get in two and a half years. You don't grow something by moving and uprooting every two and a half years. You grow something by staying there. Stay put. Get your roots. A tree is planted, a tree is rooted. You know, the, the, the contrast back in Psalm 1, the contrast here, of course, is the blessed man, and then verse 4 is the ungodly. Psalm 1 and verse 4. Are you back in Psalm 1? Look at, look at verse 4. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. I, I, I started thinking about this, and most, most of us, we really don't have a concept of what chaff is. You know, wheat and chaff and that kind of thing. But I, I think that, that maybe the closest we come to that is uh, when, you, when you mow your yard, you get the grass clippings. 
right? Uh, when Brother Philemon or Brother Ivan or Brother, these guys mow the yard here, they had grass clippings. And when the grass clippings are on the sidewalk and on the, the driveway, what do you do? What? You blow them off. You just, huh? And you blow them away. I said the ungodly are like those grass clippings. They just get blown away. You know why you get blown away with everything that comes along? Which are you? Are you a tree planted and rooted? Or are you like the grass clippings? Jacob gathers his sons together. Look at Genesis chapter 49, would you please? Genesis 49. You doing all right? We're really not far from ending. Genesis 49. Jacob is dying. He calls his sons together. And he's going to speak to each one of them. Kind of, kind of the last will and testament, you know. He's going to, but you didn't, you didn't write it out. A little hard to chisel out that in stone, you know. So he decided he just spoke it to his kids. Verse 49, or chapter 49, verse 1. Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength. I can hear Reuben saying, Yeah, come on, Dad. Bring it on. I'm your might. I'm your strength. The excellency of dignity. Yep, that's me. Excellency of power. Come on. I'm coming. I'm with you, Dad. Well, I like this so far. I'm glad you called us together. And then he got to verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Unstable as water, you'll never excel. What's water do? Water always takes the path of least resistance. It doesn't stay put. It follows the path. And you know what he said about Reuben? You'll never excel. You won't excel if you're always uprooting and never putting your roots down. A tree is planted. A tree is rooted. A tree is fruitful. When you're rooted... And you're planted and you're rooted, you'll be fruitful. He said that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth will prosper. Wow. And again, the fruitfulness was simply because it was placed by the rivers of water. So it was getting the nourishment it needed to bring forth fruit. The fruit isn't something you have to work up. Fruit is the natural result of a healthy tree. If the apple tree is healthy, it'll bring apples. If the orange tree is healthy, it'll bring out oranges. It will produce the fruit that it's supposed to. Your job is not to make it produce fruit. Your job is to keep it healthy. The job of the pastor, my job is just to keep you healthy. If you're a healthy Christian, you'll bear fruit. That's the result of a healthy Christian. So there's, Jesus said, when we abide in Him, we'll bring forth fruit. We said earlier, Jesus said He's the living water because without Him, we can do nothing. We don't have Christ, we, don't, we won't bear any fruit. It's only Him. Grounded, settled, and finding our nourishment in Jesus Christ. Then lastly, the tree is a growing thing. The tree is a growing thing. When a tree is planted and rooted and bringing forth fruit, the tree will grow. Now, uh, in fact, I was talking to Bob about this the other day. As I was reading for this message, you know, I found out that Many, many nurseries, they're, they're, they're having a hard time selling trees because 
people, when you, when you buy a, a fruit tree, for instance, you have to wait three or four years till you get your first fruit off that tree. You know what? People don't want to wait. I want to wait three or four years. I want to, I want to buy one already ready to produce fruit. Because you, you don't like waiting. And boy, that's American, isn't it? I don't like waiting on anything. And, and you know, sometimes as you watch a tree grow, sometimes you don't notice the growth so much. And sometimes that's what I have to help people in, and we do it with the prison. You know, sometimes people, you don't see the growth in your life that you, you think you ought to see. Kids sometimes don't see the growth that, in their life that other people see. You look and say, man, you're really growing up. And the kids say, man, I don't think I'm growing at all. How many of you at home had, had a doorway you stood in and your parents would measure you and put marks year by year? Anybody have something like that? Yeah. You could look and see how you're progressing because you didn't see it. Sometimes it's not so easy to see your own spiritual growth. But other people will see it. And believe me, you'll be able to measure your growth and you ought to be able to see times in your life. I told the prisoners and several of them shared how they come with situations and, and they can see how differently they handle it than the way they used to handle it. One fellow who got a, he yelled something at one guy, and this guy was a big burly guy. He come in, you know, and he said, hey, this guy wants to see you outside. And I mean, Danny, he said, this guy was like a, built like a tank and a bulldog, no nose, you know, flat nose. And he says, he's all tense looking out there. And why'd you yell that at me? Man, he's ready to tear him apart. You know what the guy did? He said, you know what? He said, that's something I should have never done. I'm a Christian. I should have never let words like that come out of my mouth. And I want to tell you I'm sorry and ask you to forgive me. And he put his hand out. He said, I was wrong. That big burly guy ready to have a fight with him just looked at him like he didn't know what to say. Put his hand out, shook his hand, and turned and walked away. You know what he found out later? That big guy who'd been in prison 24 years, rough guy, you know what he said? He said, I've been in prison 24 years and I never had anybody ever apologize to me. I never had anybody say they were sorry they were wrong. And this guy says, I sure never would have handled it that way before. You see what he's seeing? Growth. That's growth. That's seeing God grow you. And God, God help you. And so you begin to see those growth. Don't get discouraged. When a little baby begins to walk, and they, 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 first, they kind of hold on to things. Remember? Their legs are wobbly. And then you get them to let go, and you say, come on, come on. And, they, and then they, down they go. And then, what do you do? You don't say, what are you doing falling down? What's wrong with you? No, you don't do that. You say, it's okay, come on, come on, get up, get up. And you know what they do? They get right back up. At first, they fall more than they walk. But they don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged if you fall when you're first learning to walk with God and you're first learning to go with Christ. Don't get discouraged when you fall. Get up. Pretty soon, you'll be taking more steps than you're falling. And pretty soon, you'll be motoring around pretty good. Oh, you may have a problem. The, the baby may have a problem when they come to a step. You know, they'll look at it a little bit and not to... Try to get their foot up there, and they may fall again. But they don't get discouraged. They keep right on going. The same thing's true spiritually. We're newborn babes when we get saved. And so you're learning to walk, and you're going to take some falls. But you get back up, and you keep on going. And, and by the way, older Christians, we have to learn to allow the baby Christians to, to learn that. Don't scold them when they fall. Encourage them to get back up. Encourage them to keep on going. Encourage them to keep on walking. That they'll, they'll, they'll get it. They'll, it'll click. They'll begin to walk. But it won't be in my time. It'll be in God's time. It'll be in their time. So be the source of encouragement to those young ones. And allow them to grow. Because we're all growing. We're all a work in progress. 
<clears throat> growing up into what the Lord would have us to be. Where are you this morning? Are you like a tree? Is there, is there some people you need to get out of your life? So you can delight yourself in the Word of God? And to read and to study and to memorize and to meditate upon it so you can delight in God's Word? So you can be like a tree that's planted and rooted and bringing forth fruit and growing so that whatsoever you do will prosper. How great would that be? How good is that promise? That's what he told Jeremiah. You remember Jeremiah 17? He said, He'll be as a tree planted by the waters that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. What a life that is. What a great life it is. I don't know about you. I want to be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth His fruit in His season where my leaf won't wither and whatsoever I do will prosper. Let's be like a tree. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning. Thank you for everyone's attention today. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement here in Psalm 1 that we can be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Lord, I pray that this message was what, that you'll use this message in the heart of people listening this morning, both here in the auditorium and online. Lord, I pray that there'll be some in this room today that you've ministered to their heart. Maybe there's some that say, you know, I, I want to delight in the law of the Lord, as it says, and I want to meditate in it, but I've got to get the wrong people out. I've got to stop walking in the counsel and godly, standing with sinners, sitting in the scornful. I've got to clean those folks out of my life, separate from them, and saturate myself with the Word of God, and then situate myself by the rivers of water. Have that relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the living water. And then I'll be planted. And I'll be rooted. I'm going to let my roots grow down. Some folks in this room, you've got to say, God's planted me somewhere. I'm going to put my roots down where God's planted me. I'm going to stay. I'm going to allow God to grow something, to mature me, so I can be a fruitful tree. Be a blessing to others. To provide fruit and, and, and shade and be a source of refreshment to other people in my life. Never get built up. Never reach maturity if we don't stay planted and rooted. Help us to continue to grow. May Christ be our source of nourishment. May your word be our source of nourishment. May we look at our lives occasionally and see that you're growing us and you're maturing us into what you want us to be.